author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer for Author Magazine, and today I'm at the University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington with Gail Carriger, author of Competence. Gail, welcome to Author. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. You are the second archaeologist turned novelist that I've had the chance to sit down with. Yay. So uh, talk to me about that transition. Obviously, archaeology requires a lot of schooling. Yes. And so talk to me about how that shift occurred. Well, I was a uh about two years out from my PhD, and I've always written as well as been an academic, but I thought, uh, you don't make a living as an author. <laughs> so that was the one thing I was pretty sure. Who told you that? Well, I grew up on a commune with a bunch of artists. You did? And stuff, so. <laughs> Where was the commune? Uh, out in Bolinas. So it was very sort of hippie, yes, crunchy, okay. Exactly. And, and, and the, the, the message you received is there's no money in the arts. Yeah, well, I hung out with a bunch of poets and like beat poets. Uh, and right. Yeah, that was one of my parents' friends. I and see. Okay. So, and they were always poor. <laughs> and yeah. But you like to write. But I like to write. I like to do other artistic things as well. But I was like, I will instead, I'll be an archaeologist because I love history. And that's so lucrative. <laughs> okay, so you're looking at all this stuff and yes. analyzing it. And, uh, but, and so while all this and is still happening. still writing. <laughs> and, still, and when you, when you say writing, you were writing stories? Yes. Yeah. Just for myself. Just uh, a lot of high fantasy in particular. But always very weirdly tangential to archaeology, so always um, relating to, I like to borrow from ancient cultures a lot, or sure. you know, build my worlds or my magical systems around right. kind of obscure um, ancient. Well, Tolkien was a, well, he, was an histo he was a historian, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. And so studying the ancient worlds does help yes. in world building quite a bit. Gives Absolutely. it some kind of detail, right? And it's really helpful for what I initially wrote and what was kind of my breakout success, which was steampunk. Because steampunk is very object driven. Yeah. So, and I, you know, look at objects as an archaeologist and I think, what does that tell me about the person who owns that object? Or what does that tell me about the culture that created that object? So I already had that kind of. So, Solus was, a, was Solus a, a, a that, steampunk? That considered was, steampunk. It's steampunk, yeah. Yeah, so it's set yeah. in that Victorian. All retrofuturism, <laughs> yeah. Like, what is the great appeal of, like, it, it's got to be that time. Yeah. And it's these big things and everything's yeah. clunky. And I mean, I kind of get it, but. But since you're immersed into it, what is the appeal of that? I have all, uh, the, all of us, all of us within, especially second wave steampunk, are, have all sorts of theories on why. Why? And why then? It, it is fading now, but why the fascination 2007 to you know 2013 right. or whatever it was? Um, and and I. I have, have personal theories on um, sort of a fascination with the Victorian era, especially amongst Americans being, you know, the, the fantasization of a sort of rigid class system and always knowing where you belong and right. um, what manners are required. And there's sort of a safety in that. And so if you're living oh, okay. in, say, an economic downturn or a chaotic time, like that kind of past really, that gentrified past appeals. This is like anthropology on ourselves. I know. You're like doing it. <laughs> so that's, that's okay. It's that's how you one think. theory. The right. other, the, there's another theory, which is there's something very exciting about um, gear driven gadgets where the sort of technology itself is exposed right. and evident as opposed to now when we have right. all of these little silver devices and we don't understand them and everything's sort right. of secret and hidden. It's also out there with it's, this. It's bold and yeah. glorified and and exciting. So I think that also is part of it. There's a lot of stuff going on at the time. Yes, that maybe did you feel different about it when you wrote it? So this was a, a challenge to myself. So I, I'm a voracious reader, as I okay. think many of us authors are. And uh, I was really excited about the urban fantasy, paranormal romance kind of bubble that was happening in the late um, you know, 1990s, early right. 2000s and was you know voraciously reading it but i was getting annoyed with stuff about that genre i was like why is it always modern why is it always like super super violent why is it always depressing <laughs> you know and, and, and so why I, isn't I, it funny why isn't it funny right. um and then i started to look at science fiction and fantasy in particular and what was funny and there isn't very much of it and most of them are, are male voices writing funny yeah. and i was like okay i feel like 
I'm supposed to do this. And then I looked at the few short stories that I'd sold and they were always funny stories that uh. people bought from me. And I was basically like, okay, uh, I'm clearly meant to write funny stuff. That's what the world wants me to write. It's hard. It's really, really, really hard. Why is hard. it hard? It, I will fight you to the death that it's harder to make somebody laugh than cry. It's, and any, I think any performer will tell you that. I think it's- Actually, it, there's, a great, there's a great quote by an actor. They say, tragedy, they say, comedy. Now that's hard. Now that's hard, yeah, it is. And it's really hard writing it. How often are your characters themselves funny? A lot. They themselves oh, well, are funny people. Well, most of the time, actually, my main characters tend to be straight men, or uh, that, and, and then it's, there's happening. these like hysterical characters bouncing off of them. Uh, it's really hard to dwell in eccentricity for a really long time. Right. Um, but but if you have a foil, so one of the great things about Alexia is my my first character is she's a straight man, but she is she's soulless, hence the title of the book. And in right. that in my universe, that means she completely lacks creativity. Um, or kind of spontaneity or all of these things. So she always reacts practically to every situation. So right. I can put her in increasingly ridiculous situations. And she's always gonna react in this very like straight, practical, sarcastic way, which is funny. Right. But she's not she doesn't consciously see. being right. funny, right? right? And that's delightful to write. Um, and I also like gave her a foil of a, of a male love interest who's over emotional and eccentric and, cra and, right. know, and big and larger than life. Uh, partly because I was playing with the romance trope of the like it's reserved the, it's alpha. It's always the yes, other way around. Exactly. Yeah. This is important when you write the way I do, which is I essentially write comedies of manners, which right. means there's not a lot of action. I mean, yeah. I like to say something will explode, and then everybody will get hysterical, and then sit down and have tea and talk about it. <laughs> and that's not a great plot driver, right? Right. <laughs> so, it, um, so pace is extremely important to me, and I think about pace a lot, because I don't, I can't- In terms of from moment to action to action? In other words, keep it- No, that's plot. I, I'm p pacing in terms of kind of what I would call the heartbeat of the book. Yeah. So different things are pace, and humor is pacing. Like, yeah. Uh, people, yeah. your reader will give you a break if you've made them laugh. So you can use humor for pace, you can use yeah. romance for pace, yeah. um, and then you can also use something exploding for pace. Right. But so long as you're throwing the right things right. into the mix in the right order, um, the breathing of your reader and the heartbeat of the book will stay sharp, and then you can ramp it up and bring right. it back down again. But, um, and I think about that a lot as an outliner, and I think that's one of the reasons I, I am an outliner is because um, I don't, I'm not writing a suspense novel where I have plot to keep everything moving constantly. Right. At. So I have, I have to use a different toolbox, and for me, part of that toolbox is, is outlining. So, all right, so here you are, you're cooking along, you've got, you've got books out, you've got some graphic novels. Yes. People yeah. are talking about television, maybe, 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 maybe. that's, I know, that's, you know it's always maybe, right? Yeah. So what, what is what keeps you interested in it? Well, I'm super character driven, and I love you my love characters. Love characters. Yeah, and I just like to play with them and have right. them sleep with each other. And yeah. <laughs> you know, I just like, yeah. And I do write comedy, so I never have to kill anybody off. Or if I do, I can do it sort of Greek style, where it's like right. on a vat and uh, you know drowning in a vat of custard or something. You know. So you we don't talk about it. So you look forward to spending time with those people. I do. I wouldn't write them if I didn't. And I'm very. Um, very dialogue driven. Mm -hmm. uh, I always find I can I can't really write a story until I can picture two characters having a conversation with each other. Oh. Um, I call that the epiphany moment, and it's not necessarily the opening scene. But once I have usually the main character and somebody else, sometimes it's their love interest, or sometimes it's a best friend or something. Once I have that moment, I'm like, oh, I can write this book now. Oh, um, okay. And that's. I think it's because I, I just, two characters, they, I see it like a movie in my head and I just go and they start That's talking to each so other. It's so interesting, it's so different than like, this is the world and this is what's happening and this is the evil thing and this yeah. is the, which is so often driven by these kinds of stories. Yeah, no, in, in my case, the world is there and it's very like. Right, but, it, but it's the people talking it's to each people other. people talking to each other. Though. Oh, good. Um, but that's comedies and manners, right? We have one more question for you, okay. Gail, and what I would like you to do is finish the sentence. Okay. If Writing has taught you, just writing, period, has taught you anything, has taught you what? People will forgive you for changing their opinions if you make them laugh.